Um, I think we'll, we'll kick off today. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, welcome to everybody who's come. We were delighted with, um, we've had a very high interest in these webinars. These are our first Meet the Charities Regulator webinars of 2020. Um, so I'm just, my name is Heidi Keeley. I'm the Head of Communications. So I'm just going to give you a quick run through of what you can expect from today's session. So the session will be one hour. We'll be wrapping up at one o'clock. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand you over to Helen Martin, who's the Chief Executive of the Charities Regulator. And um, so Helen would like to welcome you all herself. And then we'll have two presentations. So the first presentation will be from Eamon O'Halloran. Eamon is our Head of um, Registration and Projects. And then we'll have a presentation from Yelena Krushenko. Now, Yelena is our expert in the Charities Governance Code, so she'll be speaking to you about that. Now, we did receive some questions in advance, so thank you to anyone who sent in their question already, and we'll be addressing those throughout the presentations. Now, if during the presentations you'd like to ask a question, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, and you can just put in your question there and enter and the, the panelists will receive those questions and we'll get to as many of those questions after the presentations as we can. Um, and then just to let you all know, we are recording today's session and um, we hope to make the, the webinars available um, through our website at the end. So there should be videos available to you after the summer once we've concluded the series of webinars. So I'll hand you over to Helen Martin now uh, the chief, chief executive of the Charities Regulator. Okay, thanks Heidi. Um, hoping everybody can, can hear me there. I'm always a bit nervous when we're on these uh, webinars uh, that you know the quality is good, but um, a number of us are in the office today in different locations uh, doing these presentations and um, so to make sure that the, the Wi-Fi is, is working correctly. So I'd like to reiterate Heidi's welcome to everybody who's come along today. Um, you know, this is one of these things whereby none of us could have foreseen what, what came about in terms of the current pandemic. And therefore, there are, there are continuing challenges for everyone. So we know from our day-to-day -day interactions with you as charities, and also in terms of the survey that we carried out early on in the pandemic, that the challenges being faced by charities, um, you know, include the fact that some have had to temporarily, uh, you know, cease activities. Um, we had a number of charities, particularly during the lockdown, that would have had to, to close. Um, and even if charities are open now, we know that you're facing a lot of significant restrictions in terms of the requirements for, for physical distancing and the other in terms of going about our, our, daily, our daily routine and our daily business. We also know, obviously, that there was a huge reduction in terms of fundraised and earned income, uh, leading to financial difficulties for, for some of our registered charities and great uncertainty for, for all. For everyone. Um, we also know from the comments that we received back um, and also as I said from, from speaking to you on a daily basis through our contact centre that you know charities have you know concerns with regard to the safety of their employees and volunteers and um, face challenges with regard to finalisation of, of accounts for example for 2019 um, and for companies that are uh, that are charities you know challenges with regard to um, AGM timelines and other company law requirements. So our immediate response in terms of assisting the sector was to formulate uh, COVID-specific FAQs. So these frequently asked questions um, on specific issues arising in a COVID context, and also to, to provide charities with a link to other available resources um, and to make sure that you could find those um, in, in one place. Um, and that, that's important. We also, as you know, as some of you be aware, had run a, a national radio campaign, and we decided to do that very early to make sure that we were highlighting for everybody out there, for the public, the importance of checking the register. You know, all of you here today are on the register and um, it's important as registered charities that that is acknowledged and that people know where to find more information about you. So Eamon is going to be touching on the importance of making sure that your entry on the register is up to date 
um, and that it's not something that you wait, we'll say, until you're doing your annual re report um, back to us once a year. So one of the questions that came up, Holly mentioned that we got some questions before um, before this, this webinar. We had some questions in advance and one of them that came in was, well, what is the annual report? And you know the annual report certainly if you're if you're new if you're a newly registered charity um, can perhaps be a little confusing because there there are annual reports that charities themselves produce for their members and for their stakeholders. Some of the larger charities might produce quite uh, quite big annual reports. They'll have photographs. They'll they'll have accounts of all the different maybe fundraising events that they did throughout the year. Um, and when we talk about the annual report, that's not what we're talking about from the charities regulators perspective. The annual report that we're talking about arises under Section 52 of the Charities Act. And it's a relatively short online form that charities are required to complete um, within 10, mon 10 months of your year, your year end, your financial year end, whenever that is. Um, and there's a list of, of information that you're asked for there. It'll, give, it'll ask you for a short description of your activities. It'll ask you for your gross income, for the sources of that income, you know, is it you know, cash collections, government grants. And some of this information will be published on our website, on the register, under your entry on the register. Um, and some is, is for our own purposes in terms of getting stats together um, on the sector. So um, we had a piece of research done last year by Indicon um, and it was in relation to the potential for what was known as a charity passport. Um, and their conclusion was that we pretty much had a charity passport in Ireland in terms of the register and the information that was there. But one of the interesting things that came out of it, um, and I think it's, it's backed up by the level of compliance that we've seen with the annual report, um, obligation by charities is that charities didn't feel that this was a particularly onerous requirement and um, that was good to hear because we've done a lot of work over the years in terms of um, the tool tips and, and the different tips and, and um, explanations that we give charities when they're filling out that form and also in terms of having staff available here in the you know um, in our contact centre to answer those queries so um, that annual report then is different again from what's known as the annual return. So if you are a company, you will have an annual return that you have to submit under the Companies Act to, um, uh, to the company's registration office. That is a, a much more detailed uh, form um, and you're also required to attach your, your financial statements to that as well. So I appreciate there's a, there's a lot of terminology there that is very similar, um, but for, for our purposes, for, for you, here today and for anybody who's new uh, is newly registered charity trustee and um, what you would be interested in is if you go onto our website there's a section dealing with the annual report that you're required to, to submit now if you're a new charity trustee you're not going to be submitting it for a while but I would say to you try and get up to speed with what it is look at the questions and have those in the back of your mind so that when it comes to filling out the form and um, in due course that you'll be in a position to do that so one of the things that we did in response to the recent crisis was that we were obviously aware that there were difficulties in people gaining physical access to their offices for the purposes of getting information together to finalise their, their accounts for 2019. And some of that information obviously in your accounts is what you're going to be using to fill out your, your annual report. So what we've done actually so far is we've extended the annual reporting deadline twice. And most recently it's been extended to, to the 31st of October 2020. So this recognises the significant practical difficulties that registered charities face, particularly during lockdown, and also the continuing challenges that, that charities have. Um, it, but it also you know, recognises that everybody is operating in a vastly different um, environment and quite a restrictive pandemic environment, even though we're, we're out of what we had referred to as, as lockdown. What I would say, though, is that the last two weeks of October, for any of you who've ever called into the contact centre looking for guidance in terms of filling out and, and um, submitting your annual return, that is the busiest time of year for our staff. We, we see a huge spike in calls um, and also web queries that are coming into us. So what I would say is that if you were in the lucky position um, to be able to submit your annual report early, we would urge you to do so. And in fact, we would be incredibly grateful if you could um, if you could submit it early because, because what it means that to the extent that you've got any queries, you, you know, our staff will be able to deal with those queries for you during a quietship period. 
and it'll also free up uh, our staff to deal with those queries that are coming in from charities who have faced greater challenges than, than you in terms of um, preparing and finalising their accounts and the information that they have for the annual, uh, the annual report that they'll be submitting to ourselves. So uh, we're also conscious, obviously, that the, the charity's governance code is something that everybody is still working on. And, and certainly this year was the year that, that people were, were being required to, to implement it. And that's to the extent that it wasn't being implemented already. At the end of the day, you know, those of you who are familiar with the code will be aware that what it did was brought existing legal obligations and best practice with regard to, to governance together in one place. And um, that was really, really important, we felt, because you know, rather than saying to charity trustees, well, look, go and check, check out the Act, check the particular section of the Act. We wanted to have something that was user friendly, that was easy to read and was something that could be used as a tool that, that charity trustees could, could work through. So what I'd like to ask everybody here is, you know, what does the charity's governance code mean to you? OK, I think it's a really important question for all of us to, to ask ourselves, and particularly where you're in a charity um, and you have concerns about the code or if you're in a charity and you're, you're satisfied that you're doing really well and that you've got it implemented and you'll be able to report in that way. And um, what occurs to you when you first think of it is, is quite instructive, I feel. And um, if the first thing that popped into your head was um, when you thought about that question, what does the, what does the governance code mean to me? is, oh, this is something that the charity's regulator requires us to do, or, oh, it's that awful form that we, we have to fill out. Um, you know, assuming that that's a view that's, that's shared by your, your other uh, charity trustee colleagues, then it's unlikely that your charity will get the, the real benefit of the code in any real or, or practical way. Um, if what popped into your head was that the code is a way for you as charity trustees to, to ensure that you're following your legal obligations and that your charity is operating, is operating well, and if you, know, you, you were thinking, well, actually, it's a way for us to assure the public that we are well run, that our individual charity is well run, and therefore that they can have trust and confidence in us as a charity when we go looking for funds or when we go looking for, for people to donate their time to us as volunteers, um, then you're, you're, on the, you're on the right road. And it is important that, that charity trustees um, can think about it uh, in that way. Because as I said, it's first and foremost a tool for charity trustees so that you can ensure that your, your, your charity is run well and that you can provide that assurance to the public. Um, we're conscious as a charity's regulator of the significant um, responsibility that you have as charity trustees in terms of managing and controlling your charity. And um, since the establishment of the charities uh, regulation, one of the things that we have always focused on is making sure that we have practical guidance available to you, whether that's relating to financial controls or whether it's relating to something like the governance code and the whole toolkit that we've made available on that. Um, because it's not a case where we, we want charity trustees to be caught out, you know, and suddenly, you know, find that they're not in compliance. We very much want people to be informed. So that input that we receive from you in terms of any questions that you, you send into uh, the dedicated email that we have, and also um, in terms of the queries that come in to, to our staff in the contact centre. All of that feeds into the guidance materials that we can make available to you, and we really value that, that engagement. The current public health crisis, though, you know, has meant that some of your, as I said, some of your charities are going to have to temporarily close, while some will have had to significantly restrict the kinds of activities that, that you engage in um, and the kinds of services that you can provide to people because of those um, health, uh, health protective requirements that are in place. So this means that no matter what the particular challenge is that your charity is facing, as charity trustees, you are having to make really serious and difficult decisions. So it's absolutely essential that, you know, that those decisions are recorded by way of your meeting minutes. And I know that, that you'll all be familiar with that and, and you're no doubt doing it. But the thing is that if you're doing that, if you're discussing these things and if you're recording your decisions, you're already meeting a significant number of the different standards that are set out in the code. And, and you should definitely take some, some assurance from that. Now, if having said that, um, you know, if, though, if there are those of you out there that are still worried and that you're still saying to yourself, we don't know how we're going to report on this, 
when the time comes in 2021. What I would say to you is, you know, don't worry. You know, this is something that we were not expecting and nobody was expecting that there was going to be 100% compliance with the code in 2021. We would all love that because that would mean that as individual charities and as a sector, um, the code will have delivered something for you in terms of assuring the public and um, ensuring that you have that public trust and confidence that you so badly need. But the fact is that, you know, we rarely talk about the charity sector without talking about the diversity that is there. It is hugely diverse. Registered charities differ greatly in terms of their size, whether by reference to income or the number of volunteers and employees that they have or don't have. Registered charities differ in terms of the complexity of the charitable activities that they engage in and the services that they provide. You know, on, in one area, you could be advocating um, on behalf of a particular group, or you could be providing direct services in the homes um, of, those, of those beneficiaries. There's just such huge diversity. So the diversity that we always talk about has a significance at a time like this, when every one of us is endeavouring to keep going on a daily basis in the face of great uncertainty and, and great fear, you know, fear for our health, fear for the health of others, um, you, know, you know, fear for, for, for jobs, fear for, you know, the longevity of the char charities that we're involved in. Um, and, you know, this is one of these things where I heard something recently where it says, you know, we may all be in the same storm, but we're all in very different boats. And I want to assure you that the charities regulator recognizes that. Okay, we will be sensitive to the charities, uh, sorry, to the challenges that individual charities are facing, um, and particularly how the current pandemic has played out and has affected individual charities. Um, we'll also, and this is something that we would have done in any event, we're also going to be um, sensitive in terms of how we report on the levels of compliance that we see with the code. And this will, um, this is particularly important in the early days when it'll be important to ensure that all charities remain focused on either staying compliant or achieving compliance with the code. What we don't want is there um, to be any kind of negativity associated with, so with something that it was intended to be a positive tool and something that charities can use for themselves um, to get out there and assure the public. Um, so as I said, we weren't expecting and nobody was expecting 100% compliance. Um, but what we would hope to see is increased levels of compliance over time. And that was the way it worked with regard to the annual reporting obligations. We had very low levels of compliance until charities became familiar and comfortable with what was required uh, when they were uh, submitting their annual report. And also there's a job of work for the charities regulator to do there as well, because we wouldn't have had the same kind of information available to charity trust on the annual report when it first started and um, because we wouldn't have known what the particular questions were that were arising until we had that interaction until people were practically trying to fill out the form and submit it to us so there's a learning exercise for all all everybody involved and that includes the the charities regulator so we're very much committed to monitoring the situation very closely and um, so that we can provide you with targeted guidance and assistance in terms of the code and as i said you know we're going to be sensitive to the particular challenges that the charities face. You know, you'll have some charities that are, that are, that are already in compliance because they were in compliance with previous codes. Um, and then we've other, other charities who may have had a very particular plan for this year that has, um, has been difficult to achieve because of very particular circumstances relating to their charity arising out of the current pandemic. So the main thing is, you know, we continue to add to our FAQs on the code. Um, and we'll also, you know, complement the existing guidance and template, the templates that we have. Um, and we're going to complement all of this as well with some online training. Um, it's not going to be possible to provide training for the 72,896 charity trustees that we now have on the register. Um, however, what we will do is we intend to make videos of that training available so that it's available to people as and when they require it. So it's something that you'll be able to you'll be able to dip into and anything that comes out of that training. Again, we will ensure that we try and get that up on our website in some, for, some form of guidance or frequently asked question response so that that is available to you as charity trustees and to the widest number of charity trustees. It's, it's really important um, that we do that and that any learning that we get from those training sessions that we share with the widest number of people um, possible. So before I pass you over to our Head of Registration and Projects, um, 
I want to assure you that you know we will continue to, to publish that guidance and the information to assist charity trustees and we are obviously going to continue to monitor um, the situation with regard to the current pandemic. Our aim is to be as responsive as we can and in order to do that we're hugely reliant on our engagement with each of you whether it is by way of calls or web queries we've got a new phone number up and running now so staff are able to answer calls remotely which is a great it's a huge achievement for the team and it's something that we certainly have found is working well we know that there was a real need and a desire there and for some people to be able to talk to a person so definitely if you have any queries you know make sure that you get in touch with us that that number is on our website um, and also with you know if you're Contact us by way of web queries um, or emails to our ded dedicated governance code address or responses to surveys. In fact, I want to thank the 2,223 people who responded to the early survey that we did on COVID-19. It was hugely informative and it meant that we were able to share information about the impact of the pandemic on charities with the public and with other stakeholders. So we will be issuing further surveys in future and I would ask that if you have the time, please do respond. As the greater number of responses that we get, um, the more informed we can be in terms of our regulatory responses. So I'm going to pass over to, to Eamon now and I want to thank you all again. And I, I believe some of you are going to be joining us again tomorrow where we're going to have some, some, different, um, some different presentations. Um, so I'll be talking to you again then. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Helen, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you today. It's great to see, we've, I think, all, almost 300 attendees. Uh, so my name is Eamon O'Halloran, and I'm the head of uh, registration. And uh, my presentation today is going to be a little bit interactive and very practical. So I'm hoping uh, that if I do this now, you'll be able to see. Uh, okay, so this session is going to focus on uh, ensuring that you understand your entry on the Register of Charities. And that, the, the Register of Charities is the primary tool to which we promote uh, transparency uh, for the sector. And it is really uh, important that the information on it is accurate and robust. So uh, in the uh, short session that we have, we'll give you some confidence on how to correct the Register, where you can find very helpful technical user guides, how you can make sure that you know who has access to your charity account and who updates it and who has the authorization to do so. And also one of the things that we've seen uh, over the last uh, period is that it even happened in inviting people to attend this event. We send out a, a, a contact to the charity through your charity email address and the person says, I've actually left. And um, we then, uh, in, in one case, we went back to those individuals and uh, their, their names were still appearing as trustees. So they had left as trustees, but they were still getting all the updates from the charity regulator. We sent a lot of updates around uh, annual reporting, uh, our easing, a uh, number of different things. So it's really important that we have your, your correct uh, details. Uh, and finally, I'll give you a little update on annual reporting extension and the new ways to contact us because we've had to make some operational changes following the impact of COVID-19. So we do want you to get involved and hopefully Heidi would be able to assist uh, by uh, sending out a poll. So the first one is just to understand who is here today, uh, what type of charity you are. So we're gonna ask you a quick poll and uh, if you can fill that in, it would be great. So it's asking uh, the type of uh, participant you are. Okay, um, so we may have those results in a little while. Um, the second uh, poll we'll do in a little, in a little bit. Um, so, your entry on the register. There we go. So we've we, we've got uh, about about sixty five percent of the participants today are trustees of charities, uh, eight percent of volunteers, and eighteen percent of employees. So we've got a good mix. I'm going to ask you now a second question, uh, which is, uh, what is your uh, how did you become a registered charity? 
So hopefully that poll can help you. So either you applied or you were automatically registered because you had a CHY number in October 2014. You may not know or you might not be involved. We appreciate if you can answer that question. And again, uh, we see that 32% uh, applied and were registered by us, but 43% were automatically registered by the revenue. Uh, and some of you may not know, and that's important uh, in, in itself. So um, what we have found over the last uh, period uh, is that we've done some review of the register, and we have found that quite a lot of entries, and particularly those who are registered through the revenue methods, uh, the register is not accurate. It contains a lot of information that is not true, and it probably is out of date. So what we're encouraging all charities to do, all registered charities and all trustees, is to make sure that your register uh, contains a true record of your charity. That when something changes, you don't wait, maybe wait a year to have your annual report, but you make it up to date. And thirdly, that you are aware and understand who has access to my account online. We want the right people to have the right access. Sometimes if somebody leaves, they may still have control of the account, and that's something that we want to avoid. So, <clears throat> you can all go into the public register, so it's the top uh, uh, entry under information for the public on our website, and under that you can search for your own charity. You can put in your registered charity number or the name of your charity, and it will come up under the results. Um, on the register, you'll get an entry like this. This is a charge that was registered last year. You'll get the name and the address, your registered charity number, which is not the same as the number you got from revenue. So the CHY number, which is a four or five digit number, is not the, the number by which you may actually have a tax uh, uh, number, but not have a charity registered number. So it's very important that you have the RCN, which is always an eight digit number. If you were registered through the revenue methods, the first three numbers will be 200. And if you were registered by us, the first three digits will be 201 or 202. That's how you'll know whether you're, which method you were registered by. You'll also find on the left-hand side other identifiers, which might include your social media, your company number, your CHY number, your legal form, and then the charitable purpose for which you were authorized by us, and very importantly, your constitutional main objects. This sets out what you are uh, authorized to do, and it is the key, uh, I suppose, the key mission for which you are set up. So it's very important that you know that that is the same uh, wording that's used in your constitution, and it should be the same word for word. And finally, over on the right hand side, you have the trustees, and they're the people. Uh, generally, if it's a company, it'd be your board of directors or your management committee if you're, if you're unincorporated or your trustees if you're a trust. Um, and the other information that displays in the public register comes from your annual reports. So what are we asking you to do? <clears throat> I would uh, call on all of you who are here today and, and as soon as possible to go and check your own entry in the register and make sure that the legal name is spelled correctly. And if you're a company limited by guarantee, it says that that you know your registered charity number. So you can use, check your uh, headed paper, your website, are you using this number over your CHY number, which does not display that you're a registered charity. Is the type of organization correct? We have found examples where uh, you're a company and you've put down association, uh, or you've put down something else which is not reflecting it accurately. Is the CHY number displaying and is it correct? Is your company number on the page and is it correct? Is the address you've provided us the principal address that you're operating from? A lot of charities have yet to put up their website or social media and we would encourage you to do that. So that can be added onto your entry in the register, your website or social media page. Make sure that the charge and purpose are appropriate to the work you do and get your constitution and check word for word that your main object is correct and reflects uh, the, the, the wording your constitution is reflected on the register. 
Finally, are the charity trustees current and correct? So, what we want that it's right today, and that if you, uh, as I said before, if, if there are particular changes, you don't wait to make them today. Particularly a trustee who's left and maybe gone for over a year, it can be quite frustrating for them that their name still appears on the register as being linked with that organisation. So everything is managed through my account, which is on our online portal. And through that, you can manage and update your charity records. You can submit your annual report. You can securely correspond with us. You will get important notifications and reminders from the Charities Regulator. And all of your dealings, your history of your correspondence and submissions are all kept in that place. So you can go see everything that you've ever filed to us on our new system. Um, and you can also create and manage users on your account if you are the right person to do so. So I'm going to just show you here a couple of things. Um, up at the top of our website is the login button. And in the search button, when you know what form you need to make a change, there are excellent technical guides available. You can search for them. They're also available on our Information for Charities page. Once you've logged into the portal, you will always go to the existing charity. A lot of people start making applications for a new charity. You'll always go to the existing charity and see what forms are available to you. You will also make sure that if you want to control your access, you go to the uh, profile page, which is on the top right-hand side of the portal. This is what your portal displays. So on the left, you'll have the different options. And then in the center, you will have um, your, your name and what filings you, you can make. So in that case, uh, you can see there, you can actually search for your charity on the existing file. So in our, uh, you will find a, a way in which you can update absolutely uh, everything that's on the register. So if you want to update your organization address or your email address or your social media, you will go on to our maintain contact and location of operational details form. And there's a user guide that will tell you step by step how to do that. If you want to change your charity name or you want to change your constitution, sometimes that's called change purpose, that might require our consent, uh, in the case of charity name, it will. Uh, and again, there are both technical and other forms there that you can get that will take you through that step by step. Um, where you want to change your trustees, uh, your connections or external advisors, your bank accounts, if you're using a professional fundraiser and sometimes your financial year end might change, again, there are very simple forms that you find those on the portal on the right hand side. So here's just two examples of common issues that we're finding um, and that can have a, a consequence for charities. So in some cases, a user will update their own email address, but they will not update the email address of the charity. To update the email of the charity address, you, you, that's the form that you use. Um, and then you should also make sure that if somebody has left, that they don't continue to have access to your charity account. We also find where somebody has left a charity the, uh, while the new trustees are added, the person who's completing the form doesn't delete the trustees or remove the trustees that have left. It's always best when you go into that form to start from the bottom up, to start with the removing the trustees first and adding the new trustees afterwards. Um, so some other updates. Uh, the, uh, as Helen has said, the annual reporting deadline for anyone who was due to file between March uh, the 12th and October 31st has now been extended to the 31st of October 2020 and um, that situation will be continue to be kept under review um, and has been made in line with changes that were done for companies due to file their annual returns so so that means that they're in sync if you're a charity and um, I also want to point to some new general guidance that have been provided on both on safeguarding for children and safeguarding for adults and also on protecting your charity from cybercrime both of which are available on our website Finally, uh, in order to assist charities uh, not have to go through the same process uh, on, on two occasions, in, in, uh, in future, all charities who want to amend their constitution or change their purpose, you will go to us and get the consent, and only afterwards will you submit this, the changed constitution to the Revenue Commissioner for their records. You do not now have to get dual consent, you just need to get our consent primarily and then submit on to the revenue commissioners. Um, what I would say to those who are registered under section 40, please remember that if you lose your tax, your CHY number, you will automatically be removed from the register of charities. And that has happened and there's nothing we can do about that. So if we registered you, this doesn't happen, 
but if you are on the register by that automatically deemed registration and your uh, RCN starts with 200. If you lose your tax exemption, you will be removed and you'll have to reapply to us for registration again. So <clears throat> with operational changes, we have moved to a situation where we have now a new number. Um, our phone lines have been restricted just to, to, in relation to trying to manage uh, our, our staff. So it's weekdays, Monday to Friday, 11 to 3 p.m. Our new number is 012118600. Our old number is not operational, so this is the only way that you'll be able to contact us by phone. Um, and we would encourage you to do so, particularly if you're trying to make changes to the register or correct something. Our staff are very, uh, very experienced and will, can help you uh, with any queries you might have. We also encourage charities to use our secure mail where you'll be able to keep a record for the charity. So by logging in and emailing us in the messages, rather than going and emailing from your own email, it makes it a lot more secure and you will have a record of any correspondence you had with us. So to do that, you log into the portal and then I provided a link that will take you to the messaging section of the portal. All emails uh, or all emails that are sent are acknowledged within 24 hours. Finally, we do maintain a web form and you can contact us through that. That's on our contact us page on our website. And again, all emails uh, are web are, are acknowledged within 24 hours. So uh, I'll leave you with that, uh, but just to say that they're, they're, the, the investment that you're putting into governance, in making sure that your register is an accurate and true reflection in, uh, in, in, your, in organizing your finances and making sure that you're operating to a high standard, that will set you apart from all the other types of entities that, that are trying to look for funding from the public. So we really uh, encourage you to invest in being a registered charity because uh, what we have seen from other jurisdictions is that there is accrued benefits that will set you apart from other not-for-profits. Not um, thank you for, for your attention. And now I'll pass you on to our, our experts on Charities Governance Code, Elena Grishenko. Um, thank you for the introduction, Eamon. Um, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all well, and I hope you can hear me. Um, as Eamon said, uh, my name is... Uh, Anna Grushenko, and I work in the Compliance and Enforcement Unit in the Charities Regulator, um, and I lead the role of, of the Charities Governance Code. So my presentation is about the Charities Governance Code. Um, I suppose before I go into the detail about the code, I just want to take a step back just for a few seconds. Um, what is good governance and what does it mean for your charity? Um, I can see that most of you here are charity trustees. And, and you became a charity trustee because you believe in something and, and you want to make a difference. Um, and I'm sure you don't want your efforts wasted by ineffectiveness or um, undermined by the actions of others. And you would probably agree that it could take years to build your reputation, but it could be destroyed in, in, in seconds. And governance may sound complex, but it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. And it's, it's about making sure that your charity has the policies systems and procedures that it needs um, and that these are followed. And it's actually important that those policies are followed. And it means that your charity um, exhibits transparency and accountability and responsibility and promotes confidence and trust um, among staff, um, volunteers, um, funders and other stakeholders. Um, it's also about developing a culture um, which allows your organization to thrive and it's about delivering uh, your charitable purpose um, as effectively as possible. So this is where the Charities Governance Code comes in. Um, the Charities Governance Code sets out minimum standards that you should meet to effectively manage and control your charity. And this is where it's different from, from other codes. And because it sets out minimum standards rather than best practice standards, um, it's achievable even for smaller charities with uh, limited resources. Um, as a charity trustees, you have legal duties and responsibilities. So the code is here to inform you of your legal uh, duties, um, and it sets out how to comply with them quite simply. Um, and as Helen said already, the code itself is actually based on, on, on legal duties of charity. Um, and I suppose uh, um, the code uh, can also be used as a tool uh, to carry out an annual health check, if you like, of your charity. And as charity trustees, um, you should take that, you know, the opportunity to carry out an, an annual review of your 
governance practices um, and work towards complying with the code principles. So um, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, the code is structured around six principles of good governance, as you all know. Um, um, and the six principles are um, advancing charitable purpose, behaving with integrity, leading people, exercising control, working effectively, and being accountable and transparent. Each principle is broken down into core standards that every charity in Ireland is expected to achieve. And for five of the six principles, there are also additional standards for more complex charities. So that's for charities with high levels of income, um, large number of volunteers, um, and for charities with complex um, activities. For example, if you are working with vulnerable people or operating overseas, this will make, will make you um, a more complex charity for the purposes of the code. Um, some people ask um, if we set any thresholds uh, to help them to decide whether the charity is complex or not. Um, but because of the diversity of the sector, um, it, 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 it was actually quite difficult to set those thresholds. So ultimately, it's the decision for charity trustees to make. Um, I'm, I will not be going through each of, those, of this principle in detail today, but what I would like to emphasize is the importance of having board meetings and keeping records of decisions made. And these items would fall um, under, under the principle five, uh, working effectively. And, and the core standards um, under principle five are all about the, the importance of the board of charity trustees working together collectively and in an effective manner in order to help their charity, charity to achieve its, its, its objectives. Um, attending regular trustee meetings is an important part um, of being a charity trustee. Um, and this is where most of your work as a charity trustee will be done. And you need to make an effort to attend all board meetings if possible. Um, and it's important to know that you are liable for decisions made by the board, even if you didn't attend those meetings. You need to prepare for those meetings uh, so you can contribute your views and ideas and, and play a full part in the discussion and collective decision making. Um, and I suppose just to give you just a scenario here, the board papers arrive um, in your inbox. You have a look at the um, at the agenda, you note that there is a few items on the agenda, lots of papers to go through, so you decide to look at it later. Um, but then you've run out of time and you arrive at your meeting unprepared. Um, does that sound familiar to people? Um, it isn't best practice, but, but this probably happens more than, than, than it should. Um, and we're still seeing lots of um, other issues around trustee meetings in the compliance and enforcement unit. And just to give you some examples, um, trustees are not meeting throughout the year, uh, decisions and matters relating to the charity are not being discussed and documented uh, in the minutes. There's no evidence available to show how the charity trustees uh, came to a particular decision. Um, and at times like now, um, governance is as important as ever, if, if, if not more important. Uh, and I would imagine a lot of charity trustees are making decisions which may be essential for the survival of their charity. Um, so it's important that you, uh, that you, keep, that you are keeping records of, of, of those decisions. Um, another point that I wanted to make here is that if you are um, a small volunteer on the charity, the majority of core standards within the code can be evidenced by meeting minutes. So whatever you do under the principle five, working effectively, will actually form evidence for a lot of other standards within the code. Um, so it's important that, that, that you do it well. Um, and I suppose the way we hold meetings um, is very different for, um, for a lot of charities. Physical meetings may not be possible, but there are other options available. Um, for example, conference calls, um, video Skype calls or Zoom, and this is what we're using here today um, and there's lots of other platforms and um, you know that, that you can consider um, but I suppose there's there's one thing to remember um, I, I suppose um, make sure that you are still uh, that the minutes are still taken um, as they would be at physical meetings 
And this is important um, for good governance and also for future reference when, when things go back to normal. Um, some charities will have specific rules around meetings. Um, so your, your, your charity's governing doc document should be checked first. Um, and your governing document would, would normally set out requirements around um, meetings such as frequency, frequency of those meetings, uh, notice periods, uh, who chairs the meeting, how many people must be present uh, in order for you to have a quorum um, and for, for decisions to be valid. Um, and I think some people ask what would be a quorum um, uh, and normally a quorum would be a majority um, and this keeps decisions from being made by too few people. So for example, if you have seven people on the board, so the quorum would be at least or, but, but again, as I said, you, you need to check your, your, your governing document. Um, so where do you find all the support and, and guidance um, in relation to the charity's governance goals? Okay. So if you go onto the website, so that's www.charitiesregulator.ie, um, and under the tab called, called Information for Charities, you will find the link to the charity's governance code. And that's where you find the, the, the charity's governance code toolkit with all the practical um, templates and, uh, and guidance notes. And there is quite, actually quite a few practical templates such as um, board meeting template, there is an induction path checklist, um, sample code of conduct for charity trustees, and sample recruitment policies, just to name a few. Um, and all those documents are there for you to use. Um, they're mostly aimed, I suppose, at smaller charities, but hopefully some larger cha charities will find them useful too. And also there is a completed sample compliance record form available there. Um, a lot of charities actually find it quite useful as a point of reference. So if you are going through your own compliance record form um, and if you see a standard uh, and you are not sure what that means, you can have a look at the completed sample that we have provided on the website um, and you can check you know the examples um, as to the type of actions you may take or the type of evidence you may provide um, to achieve that standard and hopefully that that will give you um, some guidance you know as to where to start um, you will also find some frequently asked questions here in relation to the code um, and those are updated um, on a regular basis um, and, and just to mention, if you didn't attend um, our Meet the, the Charities Regulator events last year, I actually went through some of those um, frequently asked questions in a bit more detail. And, and that presentation is available on the website if you want to look at it. And, and, those, and those questions are still relevant uh, today. Um, and Helen has already mentioned that, you know, in addition to all of the guidance and, and templates that we have on the website, um, there, there will be a formal training for charity trustees provided um, and there will be more information available um, in relation to that in, in the next and um, in the next year. So here are some of the key dates for you to note. Uh, so 2020 is the first year that registered charities are required to comply with the code. Um, and what I would say here, and I said it last year as well, don't leave it until the end of the year to complete the form, otherwise it will be a difficult, very difficult task. So uh, try and take a little bit um, at a time. Um, and we are halfway through the year already, so I would expect that most of you have started it, so have, have started the form. Um, actually, can we do a quick poll now, Heidi, if you don't mind? Can we just ask people how many of you here have actually started um, um, going through the compliance record form. If you can take a few seconds. Okay. Do we have Do we have the results? It is still coming in there, Elena. So I'll just okay, I'll give a few. <laughs> I'll give a few more. A few more seconds. Um, I suppose if you haven't started, there's still there's still time. But I, but I would say um, don't don't leave it any longer, and, and just make sure that it, 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 it's on the agenda for the next for the next meeting. Okay, so nearly half half of the people have started. So that that that's that's good to see. Um, 
Um, but as I said, don't leave it any longer um, and try and take it, you know, um, a little bit um, at, at the time. Um, and then, and then, 2021 uh, will be the first year that that registry charities will have to report on their compliance with the code. Um, and we're actually getting a lot of questions in relation to that in terms of when to report and how to report on compliance. So it will be a state. It will be a statement on your annual report. So when you submit your annual report to the charities regulator in 2021, you will have to indicate um, if you have complied with the codes. And if you didn't comply with the code, you will have to provide an explanation. Um, you don't have to submit the compliance record form or any evidence to the charity's regulator unless we request them. So just, just a statement on your annual report and please don't send your completed sample compliance record form or any evidence if you didn't ask for it. Um, and, and those charities who completed um, um, their annual report this year, you would, you would have seen a question in relation to the charity's governance codes. Um, and we were asking if you have commenced the implementation of the codes. Um, and this question was there just purely to see how are you getting on um, and just for us to engage with charities and just to see if there's any guidance that are needed or any, any clarifications that are needed. And we have actually engaged with a number of charities in relation to that. Um, and, uh, and, th and most charities that we have engaged with have made quite a good progress and provided some really good quality, you know, um, uh, documentation. So, so it was good, good to see that. And some of them, of those char charities were quite small. So it was good to see that they have made, you know, that 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 effort uh, to go through the forum. Um, so that's uh, so that's the that's the end of my presentation. Um, uh, on this slide, what I have is um, a link to the Charities Governance Code Toolkit. Um, and also um, there's an email address, there's a dedicated email address um, that you can send any questions um, in relation to the Charities Governance Code. So that's the governance code at charitiesregulator.ie. Uh, so any questions, just email. And if you want to speak to someone, ju just, just ask for a call back and, and we will give you a call back um, as soon as we can. Um, thank you very much.